Lithium ion batteries are now mature technology. Any declines in price and increases in performance are likely to be incremental. But Joe Adaletta, CEO of US based startup Volexion, thinks his company has developed a step change improvement that would make a big difference in lithium ion performance 30% or more at very little extra cost and with a product that will drop into existing manufacturing lines. Innovations like Volexion's new graphene coating for battery cathodes could be how the United States offsets China's advantages in manufacturing scale and supply chain integration. Adaletta agreed when I interviewed him earlier this week. Welcome to the interview, Joe. Thanks, happy to be here. Good to see you, Markham. Well, likewise, um, this is a very interesting innovation that your company has got because I can't tell you how often I get contacted by our viewers to say, Look at this wonderful new battery innovation, whatever, you know, it's usually a chemistry or some something. Uh, but what you, your team has developed is really simple and has, it just drops into the manufacturing process for lithium ion batteries, but produces big benefits. Have I got it right? Uh, yeah, that's the idea. I, I mean, I think one of the challenges uh, with battery innovation um, historically has been kind of big steps, right? Big steps that don't necessarily lead to big results. Um, and if you go back uh, since the founding of sort of lithium ion battery in the early 90s, right, it's, it's typically uh, incremental innovation kind of year on year, right? Um, so, so the idea behind what we're doing is to take something that's on its face, uh, really super interesting and produces good results, um, but that doesn't require uh, a lot of capital to deploy uh, or integration expense into the existing manufacturing. Well, let's get into exactly what this is. So what's the innovation? Yeah, so uh, we, we've really got two innovations, right? Um, the first is our ability to make low cost, high performance graphene. Um, graphene historically has been, uh, you know, a quote unquote wonder material, um, right? That really uh, hasn't, one would argue, lived up to its promise, at least the promise of the last couple of decades. Um, and that's principally because you've had two options historically. That's either to acquire low cost, low performance graphene or high cost, high performance graphene, right? So our first innovation is really the ability to make this low cost, high performance graphene. Um, and, and that's uh, an innovation that was developed by Professor Mark Hersham at, uh, at Northwestern um, that, we, that we've spun out of the lab there. And the second uh, innovation is our ability to uh, conformally encapsulate cathode active material particles um, with this material. Um, cathode active materials uh, are the things that do the heavy lifting inside of lithium ion batteries uh, and, and making that perform better is, uh, is integral to the innovation in the space moving forward. Just, a, a lot of our view, my viewers won't know uh, the different parts of a battery. So yeah. Maybe yeah. just explain cathodes and anodes. Sure, sure. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, my parents ask me this all the time. And, uh, and, and, and I tell them, you know, you pick up your Duracell battery or your Energizer, right? And it's got a pointy side and a flat side, right? Um, the pointy side's the plus side, uh, the flat side's the, the minus side. Um, and, and each of those sides has a very specific material um, that does the heavy lifting inside of the battery. The plus side is the cathode side, and that's the side that we work with. Right. And so the uh, when it's discharged, basically the electrons go from one from the anode to the cathode or cathode to the anode. Uh, yeah, when it's when it's discharged, you go minus. It's sort of counterintuitive. You go minus to plus, right? And then when you charge it, you go plus to minus. Um, move the electrons and the ions. Yeah. Great. And so you've invented a way to get graphene on the the cathode. Uh, That's right. And what are the benefits of that? Yeah, so um, everything in batteries really is about interfaces, right? Um, it, it's about one thing that touches another thing, and, and you move materials back and forth. Um, so uh, the electrolyte, which is the liquid component, right, of the battery, uh, a, a really um, caustic kind of environment for these particles to live in. Um, so the first thing that we do is we provide a level of protection, right, by by coating the surface of this material, which which mitigates. Um, exposure of the cathode active material to the electrolytic environment, right? And the second thing that we do, uh, graphene, super conductive, right? Very highly electronically conductive. Um, so uh, there are a bunch of benefits that come from the high level of conductivity associated with that, which includes things like uh, better power out of the battery. And uh, my understanding is you get more, uh, the, the battery lasts longer and you get a higher energy density. So if you were in an EV, you would have longer range. 
Yeah, that, that's right. Um, so we get uh, when 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 you coat that and you protect the material, it inherently lasts longer, right? Um, so we get better what you would call cycle life um, in battery terms out of it, right? More more times going up and down when you charge and discharge it in your in your electric vehicle. And manufacturers can take advantage of that in a number of different ways, right? You can um, get better power out, you can have longer life, you can get better energy density. Um, everyone wants a little bit of something different um, out of their battery in their specific application, but that's the that's sort of menu of benefits that you would get. Now, the coating that you're talking about for your cathode can basically, the equipment for it is not expensive. It drops right into the existing manufacturing process, which will make it very easy for battery manufacturers to adopt, right? Yeah, that's right. We use commercial off-the-shelf equipment. Um, none of this innovation is based on uh, is based on novel equipment um, or processes. You can buy this from any of dozens, probably of of global vendors uh, for the equipment. So it drops it drops right in um, to the existing manufacturing process. Um, we would place this equipment either at at the folks that produce the cathode active material itself, or at the folks who make the battery cells. Now, Joe, you've been in this space for 20 plus years. So you're, you've been around the it's block. Been, it's been a minute. It's been a minute <laughs> or a few. Um, and I've had a number of American entrepreneurs on here, uh, you know, who are working in some version of, uh, you know, the energy transition, the clean energy uh, tech. And I, I ask all of them because I'm interested in their perspective is China is so far ahead in battery technology. It's, you know, we can hardly see it off in the distance. It's, it's like that dog on the prairies, you know, it just keeps running and it gets further away, but sure. tiny spot. Can American uh, battery uh, manufacturers and innovators catch up to China, not through scale and price, but through innovation. And yours is a classic, a great example of, of the kind of innovation I'm talking about. Yeah, I mean, I, I think absolutely. Um, uh, the, the U.S. arguably has the best innovation ecosystem in the world, right? Starts with world-class universities, um, national labs, um, the uh, the financing ecosystem, right, for startups, start small startups like ours. Um, we really, uh, I believe, have an advantage there. Uh, what's it, what's incumbent upon all of us is to sort of lean into that innovation space and and look for the most efficient ways to move things from early stage development in the lab through sampling and that sort of mid-scale to mass production. And, and I think that historically that's where um, that's where really the Chinese have had a leg up on us, right? Is, okay, this looks great. Now we need to make a whole lot of it. Um, and we really need to, to focus more on that manufacturing scale here in the US to, to really leverage the uh, innovation ecosystem here. Right. Um... I've, I've got friends who are in the, you know, who are, have got some sort of innovative technology. And, and, and actually, we talk about, talked about this in Canada for decades, the valley of death. You get it out, you get enough, you get your first round of funding, you, you get it out, off, off the, the lab bench. You may be doing a demonstration project. Uh, maybe you even get to the pilot project. But now you need a lot of capital to scale up, and it just isn't there. And, and Canada is a small capital market, so it's a real problem for us. Is that a problem uh, for American innovators like your company? Yeah, I think that um, there, there's kind of two answers to that question. I, I think broadly um, in the hard tech space, um, which is what we do, right, physical sciences, um, the answer is is yes. In, in a lot of cases, uh, substantial capital uh, is required to take something from um, from being in the lab to uh, what industry calls uh, folk funding, right, first of a kind type uh, plants and innovation. Um, and that requires a lot of capital and it's generally viewed as, as riskier. I would say for us in particular, um, that's not necessarily true. We're a very capital light type of business. Um, like I said, the equipment that we use is commercially available and off the shelf. It's relatively inexpensive, um, both on the manufacturing of graphene and the uh, and, and the encapsulation side. So um, I, I think our uh, personally, our risk reward profile is uh, is is really nice. And, and we can leverage working with partners like the cell manufacturers or uh, or the OEMs to uh, to help us with that capital stack. So the value here is uh, the intellectual property that you in developing this the graphene. Uh, and I guess on the uh, both on creating the graphene and then applying it to the the cathode. So you've got yep. two. Uh, are you able to protect that intellectual property? Uh, so that people, you know, investors are confident that they will invest their capital. 
in your company? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I, I think it really benefits us that we have these two separate processes. Um, uh, from a business model perspective, um, as I mentioned, I, I think the encapsulation will take place at either the cathode active material supplier's shop or at the cell manufacturer's shop. But that allows us the opportunity to sell graphene. And, and I think over the long run, that's our intent is, is to keep the manufacturing of the core material um, in-house and centrally located. And centrally located means localized to the U.S. or the EU or over in Asia. Uh, maybe to wrap up the interview, Joe, tell us where you're at in the commercialization process and what a likely timeline is. Yeah, no problem. Um, so we can coat. Uh, a year ago, we were coating hundreds of grams of material. Um, today, we can coat tens of kilograms, so several orders of magnitude larger. Um, within the next sort of year, year and a half, we'll be in the hundreds of kilos type range. Uh, and that's just short of the uh, metric ton type level that you need for really large sampling. Um, I don't see uh, our ability to scale as the limiter to getting this technology out into the market. It's really, when you talk about electric vehicles, um, the the EV manufacturer's timeline, which could be you know three to four years from uh, from first samples to start of production. In the meantime, we're looking at shorter to market uh, timelines for you know consumer electronics, uh, wearables, iPhones, that sort of thing, um, as well as defense type applications, where I think we can really have really have benefit. Well, Joe, uh, good luck with all of that. Sounds like a, a, a couple of uh, really interesting innovations. And uh, we'll check in in a year or two and see how you're doing. That sounds great. I appreciate the time and look forward to it.